I traveled a lot when I was in the military going from one part of the country to the other. It was always difficult to find a good church, one that you could feel comfortable in. And, you know, too often we think that uh, we get a, a big raise and uh, get a bunch of money. And we think that's a blessing from God. But, you know, if it tells us we've got to move across the country, you better find a church first before you say yes to that promotion. Because it's not an easy task, and I speak from experience. But, you know, it was always the music when I would go to a church that would always tell me if whether or not I was going to be comfortable with that church. And, you know, a lot of churches I go, they have the... Uh, the praise and worship teams, and not that I necessarily have a, pray, a problem with the praise and worship teams in and of itself, but, you know, I generally can't quite tell who they're praising and worshiping, so, um, you know, sometimes I don't know if I'm a house of worship or the taping of American Idol, so uh, uh, it was always the music, though, that was uh, set the tone for me, so I, I, I love our music here and I love our church, but our, uh, I digress. Our passage for today is Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, and uh, as we go through Solomon's words of wisdom... Uh, we come to a, a, a very uh, important chapter in what Solomon has to say to his son and what he has to say to us and what God has to say to us about wisdom. So let's uh, turn to Proverbs chapter 2 and read along with me as I begin with verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge... And lifteth up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, and preserveth the way of his saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you that we can be in your house we praise you for the privilege it is that we can read your word and study it and know it and for your Holy Spirit that reveals it to us. I pray that you would work in our hearts today, teach us something new in your word, and may we guard it and use it as you would have us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we talk about wisdom and, you know, it's one of those words I think that we all kind of know the meaning of in our, in our, in our minds but to actually articulate, it can be challenging. And so before we talk about the source of genuine wisdom, I'm going to throw that question out to you. What would you say wisdom is? Describe to me in your own words what wisdom is. And anybody, just, just kind of uh, blurt it out. What does wisdom mean to you? Anyone? Manifestation of knowledge. Manifestation of knowledge? Okay. Anyone else? Tom, Tom and I discussed wisdom. I'll put him on the spot here uh, on Sunday when we talked a little bit about wisdom. And, and he had a pretty good metaphor. And, uh, so I'm going to put Tom on the spot and ask him to share that with us uh, tonight. Yeah, and how to use it. Mike. Wisdom also does something in how you get your mind to God. Do it all the way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, I'm going to read what the, the Marian Dictionary says wisdom is. Now, feel free to laugh. I know I did with some of these things, but it's interesting how the world defines wisdom. But it starts number one the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships, insight. That's not a bad one. Good sense, judgment. Not bad. This one I love, though. Generally accepted belief, right? Wisdom. Generally accepted belief. I don't know if I go with that one. Accumulated philosophical or scientific learning. That one I love, right? Knowledge. Wise attitude, belief, or course of action. That one's not bad. The teaching of the ancient wise men. That's how the dictionary describes wisdom. But no, this is not the kind of wisdom that the Bible's talking about. Sure, the Bible does address the world's wisdom. But this is not the kind of wisdom that Solomon is talking about. His is much deeper. I think James chapter 3 talks about the wisdom that's come from, uh, from above. And this is, you're all very familiar with it. It started with uh, verse 15 in, in James 3. This wisdom uh, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, de devilish. He's talking about the world's wisdom. But the wisdom in verse 17, the wisdom that's first from abo that above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. So number one, true wisdom is not humanly discovered. It's not something that man creates. It always has a divine component. It's divinely revealed. You know, which kind of takes us to the next question that I think we all 
pretty much know the answer to. And certainly in our texts, we get it out of our texts. But there may be some broader answers, you know, the source of genuine wisdom. And so we might ask ourselves, what is the source of genuine wisdom? And, you know, I came up with a whole list of my own, you know, uh, the sources. Number one, obviously God. We know that God is a source of wisdom. Uh, also, some might say Jesus Christ is a source of wisdom. Um, the Bible, that's another one. We know that the, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, first got the Holy Spirit here, in the Bible, the source of wisdom. Uh, dreams and visions, they might think that those are the source of wisdom. You know, when God and Jesus Christ are the source of wisdom, we can see that in the scriptures in Colossians 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom. So God in Christ is wisdom. The Bible, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we can see that the Bible is wisdom, a source of wisdom. Also the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the Spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of Him. And in the Old Testament, Job chapter 32, Elihu speaking, he, and he said, I am young and ye are very old, wherefore I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, they should speak, and multitudes of years should teach wisdom, but there is a Spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do they age understand judgment. So not men of age, not necessarily men of experience, have wisdom. Wisdom has a divine component. And in Acts chapter 6, speaking of Stephen, And there are always certain of the synagogues, the synagogue, the Libertines, the Cyrenees, the Alexandrians, disputing with Stephen. And Paul said, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So we see that the, the Spirit can be the source of our wisdom. And I have up there dreams and visions. Not necessarily a New Testament thing, not necessarily for our age, but definitely in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, Daniel 1.17, And as, as for these four, speak of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So there was a time when dreams and visions were our source of wisdom. But I think that we can all generally agree that wisdom comes from God. The ultimate source of wisdom is God. And certainly James 1.15, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, they give it to all men liberally and upbraid if not, and it shall be given to him. Ultimately, we know wisdom comes from God. But let's get back to our text to see what Solomon is saying to his son. It starts off with, my son, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. That word receive is laka. It is to take in and to hide my commandments. It's necessarily to, to hoard, to reserve, to protect. And he's telling the son to take it in, to hoard it, to reserve it, to protect it, to guard what he has. You know, it reminds me of, of uh, Proverbs 22, 6. Train your child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. You know, I love that verse, but you know, one thing that kind of gets me on that verse is how we're so quick to discount the Proverbs. Now, I get it. The Proverbs are not absolute laws. They're not inflexible promises. They're not a guarantee. But I don't know why we read Proverbs like, like 22, 6, and we discount it right out of the gates and say, well, that doesn't mean your son's going to, uh, all your kids are going to be non-rebellious. That doesn't mean they're all going to walk with the Lord. You know, it, and we always go to that after we read that verse. And yet what it is saying is, if you train your son in the way he should go, when he's old, oh, well, not depart from it, he won't depart from it because he can't depart from it. Because when you impart that knowledge in him, and when, as here in, in verse 1, if they receive your words and hide their commandments, if they do that and you, the responsibility as a father or as a mother, you put that words in them and they hide in their hearts, it's a guarantee it will happen. To read the verse more like this, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, it will not depart from him. You see, he might go as far away from God and as far away from that instruction as you ever thought possible. And he may be living in the gutter, but you know what? There's always that word in the back of his mind. And it's saying, don't do it. This is what you were taught. You weren't taught that. So literally, it's a guarantee. If you do your job and train your child up, I guarantee you he will not depart from it because it cannot depart from him. He can run as far as away as he wants, but he can't run away from his brain. His brain goes with him, and all that knowledge that he was taught goes with it. So we like to say that he's not rebellious, but you know, these verses aren't about whether or not you'll rebel. Yes, you'll rebel. Kids will rebel. But if you train over the ways go, it won't depart from him. That's a guarantee. 
That's not to say he won't rebel, but those words and that training is not going to leave his heart, his heart in his head. And in verse 2, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding. This is a very deep admonition. He wants you to stretch out your heart, to open it up as wide as possible. That's what he's telling us. That when the wisdom comes in, make sure you're this wide so you capture it all. Not here, narrow, but wide so you capture it all. In verse 3, Yea, if thy criest after knowledge, and lifteth up thy voice for understanding. This is a great word, criest. Kalra, it's the idea of accosting a person. When you meet them or when you call them out. You know, uh, I used to eat lunch with my son Rock at school at Trinitas, and all the grade school kids would come in there, and we'd sit, and the teachers would be in there, and it was a wonderful time. And one day we're eating lunch, and all of a sudden, Rock's face turns beet red and purple. He's choking. So immediately, I get up, and I snatch him out of his chair. I, I think I sprained his neck doing that, and I'm giving him the Heimlich maneuver. I probably bruised a couple of lips, you know, my adrenaline, or, or ribs. My, my, my adrenaline's pumping, and he clears it, and he was fine, and the whole place, you could hear a pin drop. It was, it was quiet, and everybody was kind of in shock, and it took a few minutes for things to get back to normal. But you know, the next week, I don't think it was a week later, that we're all eating lunch again, and everybody's having a good time, and I hear this voice, the third grade teacher, Mr. Merck, Mr. Merck, Mr. Merck, and she's crying out for me, and so I get up, and I quickly run over, and I'm going, over. one of their kids was choking. Right? Who better to call? I mean, the expert in the Heimlich, so she calls me. So I run over there, and fortunately, the child had cleared the piece of food, and they were fine. But that's, that's kind of what Solomon's here. That's the kind of crying out. You know, imagine you bring your loved one into a hospital, and they're sick, and they're not feeling well, and they're laying on the gurney. They've got all the tubes and the monitors hooked up and the heart monitor's doing this and the doctors and the nurses are standing around. They're all kind of chit-chatting. And all of a sudden they flatline. And the doctors and the nurses just sit there and they're not doing anything. And what would you do? You'd cry out, do something. Hey, don't just be idiots. Don't say like idiots. Come do something here, right? That's, that's what Solomon's talking about. This is, this is not a, hey, give me some knowledge, give me some wisdom. This is a deep desire to get it. And in verse 4, if thou seekest her as silver... And searches for her as hid treasures. You know, to strive after, to seek after. You know, the Bible talks about how the people of the world are actually smarter than the people of God when it comes to making money. You know, let's turn in your Bibles and follow with me. Luke chapter 16. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. And, and, and it really is a, a, a great scripture. You all are familiar with it, I'm sure. But Luke chapter 16, I'm going to read through the first five or six verses here. And he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said to him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be a steward. And then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away me from the stewardship. I can't dig, I can't beg, I'm ashamed. I'm resolved what to do. When I put on my stewardships, they may receive me into their houses. So he calls every one of his Lord's debtors. He says the first, how much do you owe? And he says, 100 measures of oil. And he says, give me your bill. Take your bill. Sit down. Give me 50. And he said to another, how much thou owest thou? And he said, 100 measures of wheat. And he said to him, take thy bill. Right for score. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. You know, what's the principle here? The principle is that if believers, if children of the light would put as much energy and much stock in their soul as the people of the world put in their wallets, all oh, the things that we would do, the things that we would do. And you know, the people of the world are very wise in making money. You know, I just saw the Forbes top 25 richest people in the world. And you know, I doubt one single person on that list was a Christian. Now, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm just guessing. But I do know this. The church and believers in general are so longing for somebody of prominence to be a Christian. We'll latch on to anybody. You know, if somebody is wealthy or somebody's popular and we think they're a Christian, oh boy, we want to elevate them. And I don't know one person on that list that is elevated by the church. So I doubt any of them. I know Jeff Bezos is probably not a Christian. Now, I can't say that with for sure, but if he was, I guarantee you we'd know it. I mean, you got guys like, what's his name, Kanye West. And I don't know, he sings a few Christian songs and the church wants to say, he's a great guy, what a great Christian. Why, just because he's popular and he's prominent. So I, I'm quite convinced that if these wealthy people were Christians, we would know it. But what he's saying here, the principle is, you know, the world knows how to make money. And if we knew how to treat and, and minister to our spirits like they know how to minister to their wallets, we could do some great things. We could do some great things. And verse 6, and here it is, right? The Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. 
Yahweh, Jehovah, you know, Thomas taught a message on all the names of God, and we're talking about Jehovah, the self-existent, the eternal God here. He gives wisdom. And in verse 7, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Mogain, that's the word for buckler. It's a shield or a protector. In the Hebrew, it also refers to the skin on a crocodile, an alligator, that thick, tough skin. And what's he saying here? God gives us wisdom, and he protects us. And finally, in verse 8, he keepeth the pass of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. That word preserves the way of his saints. That means to build a hedge, a hedge around his saints. And he keeps the judgment. He literally guards the road of judgment. He guards the verdict. He guards the sentence. He guards the law. He guards the privilege. He guards the justice. And he builds a hedge around his believers. That is what God does for believers when we walk in wisdom. And so we know that God is the true source of genuine wisdom. Ephesians 1, verses 6 through 8 to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable, accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of the grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. It is God who gives wisdom and understanding. So now we have the source. But I want to take a deeper dive. Broaden our understanding of, of, of wisdom. You know, that's the Hoover Dam up there. And I had the opportunity to go see it. I love it. It's a beautiful thing. My dad always talked about the Hoover Dam, and I had the opportunity to visit there. And, and, you know, maybe you'd say, hey, what is the source of the Hoover Dam? And you could ask me that, and I might say, well, it's the water from the Colorado River. And, yeah, that is. We, you might talk about the concrete and the men that poured it, the hundreds of men, and some of them, many of them lost their lives. You could talk about Herbert Hoover being the source of the uh, Hoover Dam. I mean, it, it started his administration. It's named after Herbert Hoover. So we could talk about that, the source. Primarily, we probably say that water is the source of the Hoover Dam. But what if I said, how do we get there? How do we get to the Hoover Dam? You know, I, I tell you, you know, we can take I-10 out west, we pick up I-49 in Louisiana, take it north, pick up I-20, go to Dallas, pick up 287 north till we get to Interstate 40, take that west through Albuquerque, through Flagstaff, pick up exit 48 and go north on US 93. And when US 93 crosses the Colorado River, you are at the Hoover Dam. That's where you're at the Hoover Dam. Now, maybe I would say, yeah, just take US 93. Now, if I told you to take US 93, US 93 is 1,359 miles long. So you can be a lot of places on 93, but not at the Hoover Dam. Or maybe I'd say, get in a rowboat and get on the Colorado River. Well, the Colorado River is 1,450 miles. So you can be a lot of places in the Colorado River and not be at the Hoover Dam. Yeah. So the bottom line is, I don't care where you're at on US 93, all 1,359 miles of it, or wherever you're at in the Colorado River, all 1,450 miles, if you are not at the intersection of 93 in the Hoover Dam, you are somewhere else. You're anywhere else, but you're not at the Hoover Dam. And why do I share that with you? Because now everybody that leaves here is going to know for the rest of your life where the Hoover Dam is. <laughs> I say that because there is a path to wisdom. And we know the source, but how do we get there? How do we get to wisdom? And I would submit to you that wisdom is at the intersection of knowledge and obedience. you got to have both. You can't have one without the other. You might be the smartest person in the world, but if you don't obey, you're not very smart, are you? We wouldn't call you a wise person. And you can be the most obedient. You know, I served in the military, the greatest soldier. If you don't have knowledge, you don't, you don't talk wisdom there. I mean, you teach a young kid, little child, don't stick your finger in the fire, you're going to get burned, you're going to get hurt. And maybe that child obeys you, maybe he doesn't. But if he sticks his finger in that fire and he gets burned, it's not because he doesn't have the knowledge, it's because he didn't obey. And you wouldn't say, boy, what a wise child, he sure knows how to learn a lesson. Well, he wouldn't call that wisdom. And you know, some of you, uh, you served in the military, you know that an unlawful order, you are bound to disobey an unlawful order, and you can't hide behind it. So your superior officer tells you to do something, and you just obey. I'm going to do it because my officer told me to do it. But it's an unlawful order, and you don't get to hide behind that and get protection from the US UCMJ. You are expected to know what an unlawful order is and not obey it. You can't hide behind the fact that, hey, I was just being a good officer, good junior officer, obeying my command. No, obedience 
and knowledge. That's wisdom. And at the crossroads of the two is the only place that you'll find wisdom. And I'd like us to turn to Jonah. It's a book that we all know, but I, I want to kind of change our focus on what you probably know about Jonah and what you've always learned, because Jonah really demonstrates what I'm talking about here. Open your Bibles and turn to Jonah. I'm going to read through it quickly because we're all rather familiar with the story, but I think it really bears out what we're talking about here, because in the first chapter, we know that Jonah had knowledge without obedience. So let's start with chapter 1. In verse 1 of Jonah, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down to it, to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind in the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. And the mariners were whose cause is evil upon us. Verse 9. I am a Hebrew. God to do. God wanted to. I get. Period. All right. Today, but Jonah was pretty anti-Gentile, like Gentiles in general. I see. There are two ways. God. Maybe fell on top of him or something. So I sprint up the stairs to go find what was wrong. Sure he's okay. All he had done, he had taken this off the bed, dropped it on the floor. He was fine. But my point is, I didn't stop halfway up the stairs. And I'm running to walk back. Sometimes I got to go back into the car to look for clues. All right, why did I go in the house? <laughs> when we move fast, we know exactly what we're doing. But when we're moving slow, boy, our mind can just kind of wander. And here's Jonah at the beginning of the verse. He's moving. He knows exactly where he's going, what he's running from. But now, toward the end of the chapter, he's, he's lying asleep. He's drifting away. And how do I know that? Because he comes out, he comes up with, really to me, is, is such a bizarre and idiotic uh, um, uh, pathway to go. Throw me overboard. Because what really is he being, uh, is he asking here? This is a suicide. You know, he, he would rather be dead than alive. But you know, he's a Hebrew, right? And he knows he can't commit suicide. He can't kill myself. So you guys throw me over. And it's not really like suicide. Oh, it's suicide. Make no mistake about it. And it isn't like he thought he was just going to swim home. I mean, some translations say they hurled him over. You know, I don't know too many people that want to go swim and think they're going to swim home. They get hurled over the side. You know, I was in the Navy, and sometimes we'd be out to sea, and we'd go swimming off the fantail. And, you know, if I wanted to go in the water, I didn't call a bunch and say, hey, could you do me a favor and hurl me over the side? I'd like to go swimming. Right? So if he really just wanted to calm the storm, why didn't he just get off and just kind of jump in the water and swim away or do whatever? No, because he knew this was suicide, and this is what he wanted. And not only was he going to be able to escape having to go to Nineveh to see God have mercy on these wretched people, but he could be a martyr to boot. These people are going to love him. You know, they're going to talk about him for generations. They're going to tell their grandkids, hey, you know, I remember we are out to sea. We had this guy named Jonah. Man, God was going to destroy the ship, but Jonah, he was such a great guy. He gave himself. He, we hurled him over, and the, the, the storm stopped. He was a great guy. See, so Jonah, he's trying, to, he's trying to outflank God. And this is what happens when we drift away from God. We, start, we get so unwise, we think we could fool God. But we know God had a different, a different plan for him. And he couldn't outflank God. But he had all the knowledge. But he sure lacked obedience. In chapter 2, is the repentance in chapter 3 is his obedience. So we have chapter 1, we have knowledge without obedience. In chapter 2, we have knowledge and obedience, chapter 2 and 3. So the two come together, and we can say he's being pretty wise here. He's doing what God wants him to do. But, you know, then we come to chapter 4, and those two diverge again. He's got the obedience part, but he doesn't have the knowledge. Turn to chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I lifted, I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, merciful and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city. And in verse 6, And the Lord God prepared a gourd, a gourd and made it come up over Jonah. 
that it might be a shadow of his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad for the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, and it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did rise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon, his, uh, upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted. And he wished himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for, thou, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city? You know, I, I was in Iraq in 2006 and seven, and almost a year, so I know what summers are like in the Middle East. And, you know, it was after my experience that it really brings chapter 4 alive to me in a way that I don't think I could have uh, realized. Um, it gets hot. You know, I lived in Abilene, Texas. It might get to be 100, 105. You know, I've been to Arizona, 107. I've even felt 110. You know, Iraq, 120 was not unusual. Sometimes 125. I have a digital, um, I had a digital thermometer it was 138 degrees in that Humvee. It's hot. It's like a heat that you never experienced before. At least I never experienced before. And I remember one day we were uh, outside. We had these big tents, and you've probably seen them on television, these big dome tents. You have a steel structure and a thick canvas around them, and we basically park our vehicles in there. And, and I was standing inside that dome tent, and we're just kind of hanging out talking. And, and the, 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 uh, the sun was kind of behind us, so it was beating this way. So I was just inside the shade line right here. And everything was good. You know, we're talking. Everything's fine. And I wanted to check something outside, so I took a step forward, and I was in the sun, and immediately, it was this blast of heat like, like I could never even felt before. It's like opening an oven, and, and when you're baking something, and that heat blasts you in the face. It was so profoundly different. I literally started to amuse myself. I'd take a step back, I'd be comfortable, wow. I'd take a step forward, it would be this miserable heat. Uh, it, was, it was so incredibly different. It was actually amusing. And, and after that experience, when I read this, it gave me a whole new understanding of what Jonah felt. I mean, he's got this big, giant, fat, comfortable leaf over his head. He's loving life. And I can tell you, it doesn't take much in that Middle East heat to be comfortable when you have shade over your head. So he's got the shade over his head, and all of a sudden the worm comes along and takes it away. He is miserable, angry, furious. And not only that, but God sent the wind in there. And I'll tell you, anybody who's been in the heat and the wind knows it's like a double dose of pain and anguish. But you know, his physical pain paled in comparison to the emotional pain that he was feeling. He was angry with God. He was angry with what God did and why. And you know, you say, well, he obeyed, but he didn't have the right attitude. You know why he didn't have a right attitude? Because he lacked the knowledge of what God wanted to do. He didn't know why God wanted to send him to the Ninevites. And it wasn't just about the Ninevites. That city fell 150 years later. It was about Israel. You know, years ago, I, I took a contracting job as uh, uh, working for the government, flying for the government. And Rock was little. He was about three years old. And I needed somebody to come take care of him, come watch him while I went to work. So I found a gal, and she had a little girl. She said, I'll do it, but I have to be able to bring my little daughter. Her daughter was about two years old, and she was a tiny little thing, little thing. And so they would come to my house, and the contract went on for about three months. And so I guess I kind of became somewhat of a fixture in this little girl's life. And my understanding was she didn't really have much of a father figure in her life. And, of course, I'm very affectionate with my son. I'd come home, he'd jump in my arms and, you know, all that great stuff. And here's this little girl without a father. She just kind of watched that and whatever it was doing in her mind, I don't know. But one day I came home. I sat down on the couch and they're getting ready to go. And here comes little Bella. She walks over. She climbs up on my lap. She puts her head on my shoulder. I could tell she wanted a father. She didn't have one. And she found one. And, you know, then it wasn't five seconds later, here comes Rock. He walks right over, he gets on my lap, he puts his head on my shoulder. You know, it was like he was jealous, like, that's my dad. You don't get to love my dad without me. You know? And this is what God wanted Jonah to see. It wasn't just about the Ninevites. It was about Israel. Would Israel look at the Ninevites and say, hey, that's my God. You don't get... He had obedience. And that's our lives. Knowledge and obedience. If you want to be in the center of wisdom, you have to be in the center of knowledge.
when I was kind of shy. But lacking the ability, the ability and nothing wise about that is patient, long suffering. I'm with God. It's a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day because I asked for 